The chair now recognizes Mr. Marshall for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Fletcher, for holding this hearing today to discuss a nuanced and significant issue. First of all, I want to congratulate you on your appointment to the chair of the Environment Subcommittee, and I look forward to working with you. In this committee, we may not always agree on everything, but I hope that we can agree on objectives and, and goals. Our objectives should be thoroughly, to be thoughtfully listened to the science and theories surrounding these topics. And our goal, at least in my opinion, should be to leave this environment of this country and the world better than we found it for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations so that we can all flourish. I was just reminded this past week, I, was, uh, I got to help my grandson catch his first fish uh, in the ocean. One of my loves is, is fishing and uh, tasting the outdoors, so it was great to, to be able to do that. But I have to be honest, the closest thing we have to oceans in the state of Kansas are amber waves of grain. So this is a unique opportunity for me to learn about the relationship between climate and the ocean. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today and hope we can find a way to talk constructively about these issues and more importantly about potential solutions. Oceans cover more than 70% of the earth and contain more than 90% of the life on our planet. Oceans, more specifically phytoplankton, produce most of the oxygen that we breathe and absorb most of the carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere, creating a cycle of oxygen and CO2. I have to tell you, I was giddy when I got to read some of your reports and go back to some of my biochemistry days. And uh, it just brought me back to my, my college days in so many ways and, and just really, really enjoyed the papers. I know congressmen are supposed to be excited about science, but I, I really am. Like plant and animal life on land, um, marine life and oceans themselves evolve. The chemistry and ecology change and life adapts. It's been happening for millions of years, but unfortunately, scientific evidence suggests that the pace of change, like the chairwoman said, has increased over the last century, adding more stress to our complex marine ecosystems. Some of this stress is the result of increased levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that are absorbed by the ocean. The result is a change in the chemistry of the oceans in which researchers have noted increased water temperature, lower pH levels, and decreased oxygen levels in certain areas. It's essential that we gain better understanding of ocean chemistry, effectiveness of potential solutions, and mitigation of negative impacts. For instance, some species are proving more resilient and adaptable to changing conditions. One of our goals should be to better understand this resiliency and find ways to translate this knowledge to broader ecosystem sustainability. One of, our, one of our witnesses, Dr. Tom Fraser, is the director of the University of Florida School of Natural Resources and Environment. He will go into detail in his research to help us all better understand the impacts and changes in aquatic ecosystems, as well as discuss some of the potential solutions to maximize environmental and economic value of our oceans. I believe advancing technology is the best path forward. As we speak, industry and governments around the world are examining carbon removal and garbage storage technology. There's some big ideas out there, from direct air capture to genetically modified phytoplankton and giant kelp farms, which I'm especially interested to hear about in the ocean that can absorb carbon dioxide. We learned during our hearings two weeks ago that moving entirely to renewables is not realistic or sustainable. So we must consider solutions like these that can help reduce or remove emissions generated around the globe. Researching, developing, and deploying these technologies will take a little time, but the payoff will be significant. Innovating our way to solutions has been a trademark of the American spirit since our country's inception. For example, in my practice as an obstetrician, I've seen how private innovation and response to market demand have done more to improve and drive down the cost of health care than any law or regulation written here in D.C. Just look at the evolution of medical imaging. Forty years ago, MRI machines and CAT scanners were just hitting the market. But now we have high-resolution microscopic cameras that reduce the need for invasive surgeries and provide us a window into human health in ways that we never thought or I dreamed possible. Basic research, industry innovation, and thriving marketplace are what brought these technologies and others like it into our lives, not government regulation. We need to prioritize instruments that target the most impactful areas of research and provide specific steps for resiliency planning. America must lead the way and partner with industry to develop innovative technologies and solutions to the problems discussed here today. I thank our witnesses for being here today, and I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. 